Okay, we are. We also, are, um, the yes. the lectures that you uploaded previously, they're no longer accessible. Like that link isn't working. Oh no! I'll re we'll uh, we'll re share it. Okay, thank you so much. Right. There's a short history of uh, in this introductory chapter in in what he means by the Persianate world, and it's intimately connected to um, the spread of the Islamic empires and how Persian became incorporated into Islamic civilization uh, and and eventually became a language and a literary culture uh, of the elite. So here's the Hejaz, right, over here, uh, at the entire Arabian Peninsula. Now, the Arabian Peninsula was in the seventh century, right, a really remote backwater of the world. No one was interested in it. Uh, it, was, it had a small population big desert, um, the tribes that lived there all spoke uh, dialects of a related language called Arabic. And nobody needed to know Arabic or speak Arabic or even know that Arabic exists outside of this little unimportant desert. And then there's the advent of Islam there is the spread of the political frontiers uh, of the new Islamic state, this, this absolutely mind-blowingly fast and successful um, expansion of the frontiers. And, and with the expansion of the political frontiers of the Islamic state, you get obviously the expansion of uh, Arabic as a language of power outside of the Arabian Peninsula. And it's a language of power in the beginning, not because, um, not because uh, it was the language of the Prophet or the language of the Quran, because the early Arab conquerors were not really interested in converting the newly conquered peoples. Uh, it is because it was the language of the ruler. So the new ruling class that conquered everything from like here to here, which was more than half the known world at the time, um, they spoke Arabic and they used Arabic to run and establish their governmental administration. Arabic, they also patronized Arabic as a language of literature, education, and law. Law was very important, obviously, because it was being derived from the Quranic text. And so um, Arabic got a boost because of that. Eventually, North Africa, which actually used to be um, a part of the Barber. Mediterranean, Haji. Hello? Barber is speaking. Berber, but also Latin, huh? it used to be part of the Roman Empire. Anyway, this became a fully Arabicized zone, right? And today, to date, remains uh, Arabic speaking. But what happens in the rest of, you know, the Eastern expansions um, of the Islamic Empire is this is, if I were to really close up in, this is basically larger Syria, Lebanon, Jordan is all over here, Iraq. Huh? These uh, were the early, you know, they became the heartland of uh, the Islamic empire with Baghdad somewhere there. And this was all Arabic speaking initially. But as the empire expanded into, now this is greater Persia, right? Straddling a bit of Pakistan and uh, Central Asia. Over here, through the eighth to the 10th centuries, 
a new kind of Persian, which was a mix, right? Again, we have a khichdi, a mix of ancient Iranian languages, a little bit of Turkic languages, and the very strong influence of Arabic. So you get this new language called New Persian um, that emerges between the, well, really between the 9th and the 10th century CE. And then it spreads really fast as the lingua franca all across this zone of the Islamic world. And it is, it is also part of elite education in this Arabic speaking uh, zone of the Islamic world. So it, in ways it becomes the more, in, by the 10th, 11th century, it becomes, Persian becomes the more important and more widely used lingua franca across the entire Islamic world from, this is Southeast Asia. And I, I've said this before and I'm saying it again. I don't want you guys to ever mix these things up. This is South Asia, that's us. This is Southeast Asia, which is Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, and you get this entire huge cultural zone. It is tied together. I, I'm going to uh, take a slightly different position to Professor Eaton. This entire zone is very much tied together by something that for now we will call Islamic culture. It's very diffuse, it's very diverse, but it's there. And this Islamic culture is carried in two languages, Arabic and New Persian. Aaj ki jo Farsi hai, it's, a, it's, it's, exa it's pretty much the same. It is, it is this language that evolved by around the 10th century CE. Jisko eaten New Persian keh rahe hai, wo hazar saal purani hai, or wohi zaban hai jo aaj Iran mein boli aur likhi jati hai. Ye wohi Farsi hai jo Mughalo ne Hindustan mein istemal ki. Ye wohi Farsi hai uh, that was the language of law and state in the Ottoman Empire and the Safavid Empire. There's hardly any change. So there you have it. That is your Persianate world. Now, now that you're seeing the extent of it, I, I hope it, it makes it, you know, uh, a lot clearer what it means when Eaton says that um, the thing that Persian and Sanskrit had in common is that they were linguistic and literary cultures that had spread over vast regions and did not have a fixed home. Pre-modern dunya mein, for instance, the Mughals would never, ever have uh, accepted or even thought that Safavid Iran mein uh, zyada authentic ya zyada achi farsi boli ya likhi jati hai. Kabhi nahi. Un, wo balki kehti te ke hamari zyada achi hai. You know, and their, their poets used to be in competition with each other. There was no regional claim on Persian as a language in the pre-modern world. And that was not entirely true of Arabic, you see, because Arabic had these very important origins in the Arabian Peninsula and particularly in the Hejaz as the cradle of Islam. So that's one of the reasons that Persian might have become the larger lingua franca for the Islamic world. Uh, yes, Omer. Uh, Miss, I have a question. Yeah. So in the book, there is this direct quote, um, but new Persian was now the lingua franca having replaced the region's indigenous Iranian languages and dialects. So did the new Persian like sort of suppress um, the other languages that were present in um, Persia, like uh, the old Persian that was there, and was it because of the new Arabic script? 
yes and yes you uh, interpreted that absolutely correctly so older persian has uh, actually only survived in um, by and large in the texts of ancient persian religion which is the parsi religion parsi comes from pars fars which is you know the old word for persia persia comes from fars right um and uh, that language, Avestan, is uh, and, and along with various inscriptions and things you find in on monu ancient monuments uh, in Iran and Iraq. Bas voi vestige regia. Otherwise, no one speaks those languages anymore. You're right. Um, they were wiped out or subsumed into new Persian. That didn't happen everywhere, Indeed. though. Right? It didn't happen everywhere where the languages where the local vernaculars were very close to the new Persian, the local vernaculars were not so close, such as all of Central Asia. So in Central Asia, you get these um, Turkic tribes who all speak different Turkic dialects and they speak them. That is their language of everyday use. But the language that they use for politics and trade is new Persian. Any other questions? Sadly, I don't have a map for the diffusion of Sanskrit culture, but maybe you guys can help me recreate it uh, based on what you've read. Where all was Sanskrit, the lingua franca and the language of elite literary culture. What regions and areas of the world was Sanskrit found in? G. Mamadel. Um, Sanskrit was found basically uh, uh, what we uh, in North India part or uh, Pakistan ke andar ye jo Upper Kashmir or uh, K P K P under Gandhara jisko bolte hain. Sanskrit was widely spoken uh, as lingua franca. Yeah, so North India, but um, where else? Because remember this. It would also have been, it would also have spread through entities like the Kushan Empire. Uh, G. Uh, Umema. Um, there's also uh, a language in like Indonesia and Malaysia, which was derived from Sanskrit and it was Malay, the language. Uh, you keep muting, but yes, you made your point. That's right. So, um, wherever today you find some form of, uh, Vedic religion, which we will call Hinduism today, but you know that it extends outside India. It's, it's in Nepal, it's in Myanmar or Burma, it's in Sri Lanka, it's in Indonesia. And it exists because Vedic religion, language and literature kind of came together as a package deal to these uh, areas of the world. And so um, you today where you have vestiges of, um, you know, uh, Hindu culture and communities, un, wo jaha jaha bhi hai, waha pe phir ek Sanskrit influence hi hai because this whole supposed religion is actually carried in these texts that are written in Sanskrit. The importance of Sanskrit at the end of the day is that it is the language of the Vedas. And the people who followed the Vedas, wherever they went, they took this Vedic tradition with them. Or when we talk Vedic tradition, there is a religious aspect and a literary linguistic aspect. Um, 
But then very similar to Arabic, actually, Sanskrit is developed in all these regions under uh, Hindu rulers who patronize the literary development of Sanskrit. And so it becomes the language of government and it becomes the language of scholarship and it becomes the language of literature. And all the texts that are produced uh, move around in this wide uh, space where Sanskrit is spoken, just as you and I can, you know, get on the internet and read anything that we like written by any anyone in the world, so long as it's written in English. So literary cultures and the regions in which literary cultures circulate are really important in helping understand how the world has been connected over time through history. And the, the sort of interesting thematic argument that Eaton is making in this book is that the more recent history of South Asia is really a history of how two diffuse literary worlds came to overlap with each other and how one influenced the other. In the period that we are studying and the period covered by this book, roughly, you know, the year 1000 to the late 18th century, which is the rise of the British colonial state, these seven, eight centuries are marked by the dominance in South Asia of the Persianate literary and cultural sphere of influence over the Sanskritic. But the Sanskritic does not disappear. It very much continues to exist. It even receives patronage from uh, the new elite who are Persianate. It, there is a, a huge and um, very fruitful exchange of ideas. Uh, between the two um, literary cultures and so on. Okay, we're out of time and I'm sorry, today was a really like difficult class. Uh, I think we have recorded enough to actually get a, um, a summation of the discussion today, which was primarily around this idea of Persianate and Sanskrit uh, zones of influence uh, of Persian and Sanskrit as diffuse literary cultures and the idea of a lingua franca. I just have one last question for you guys before I go. And that is, what do you think it means when I say or Eaton says literary culture? Literary culture, kya hota hai? Maybe the poetry or the writings of the uh, particular culture. Okay, poetry or writings. What kind of writings? Yeah, so that's what I'm thinking. Like when when we use the word literary, our mind immediately goes to things like poetry. But what else might be uh, literary? Okay, I'm going to like to hear religious someone. texts. Yeah, uh, Kaval. Yes, miss. Um, I think literary culture would include any sort of um, even discussions, I guess, that sort of influence the masses and like what is being talked about in terms of um, what is popular, like in sort of an intellectual way. I don't want to use the word intellectual, but uh, no, that's, that's fine, my perspective, actually. I think. Okay. Um, yeah. You're widening the scope, which I want you to do, but the where the line is drawn is between what is written and what is uh, spoken. Um, so, I Iman? I think the literary culture is also going to include the academic writings and all the other, you know, arts, form of arts and entertainment, maybe. Okay, so we've established that it is something quite broad. It is not merely poetry or plays 
or novels or stories. It's basically everything that is ever written or composed in a language creates a literary culture. And all languages have a literary culture, but some languages have a richer and deeper one than other languages. Ramin? Yeah, no, I was going to make the same point that it may include like legal and judicial documents as well, because it gives us an idea of like, you know, the frameworks that were in hold at that time, include uh, as, alongside all the other like literary and academic works. Okay, thank you. I think we can leave it at that for today because it's it's one of the it's one of the themes I'd like to keep returning to throughout the course so we can understand how literary cultures actually create cultural zones and regions of influence they're very very important G Jyoti um, yes, I just have a question that will there be any quiz on Thursday because I'm actually traveling so that's why I want this week to know no no I... nothing this week you guys can all relax this week <laughs> uh, just keep up with this reading because the reading is going to get heavy from next week on um, which is we're going to read all of the following chapter which is very big and we're going to take two weeks to read it um, but I'll also post a set of guidelines for that soon okay Thank you. Any any last questions? Um, people who need to leave are free to leave. And anybody who wants to stay for a few more minutes because they have questions is welcome to stay. Yes, Omer. Uh, miss, will we have an on-campus class soon? Um, I don't know. Why? Because a lot of us want one. OK, sure. Any other questions?